Okay, it's time to put your knowledge into practice and make your very first convolutional neural network. Let's go. For this project, you will be training a CNN to classify data from the fashion MNIST dataset. This is just like the original MNIST dataset, but for fashion items instead of numbers, some of which are shown on the slide. Your starting point will be a completed version of the fashion MNIST demo that I made that currently uses a regular multi-layer perceptron to classify the data just like you learned about before. Head to the project page shown here and fork a new copy that you'll use to implement this project. Let's quickly take a look at some of the updated code in this starting template versus the MNIST number classification example you previously made. First, it uses a new training data set of fashion images instead of numbers but there's still 28 by 28 pixels in size and grayscale just like before. There are 10 classes of fashion items, so no changes to the output layer size either. Next, the normalization function you created before is back, as the training data for the fashion MNIST dataset is not normalized by default, unlike the MNIST numbers which were. Also notice that I've updated the normalization function to be a bit easier to use with image data. Here, you can just pass the min max values directly as numbers, as you know the images will always be in the range of 0 to 255 when not normalized, instead of having to use tensors when you call the function, so the code is a little cleaner to read. Next, after the model is trained and you perform a classification, you'll now need to convert the position of the highest output number to a human readable name of what the index position actually represents. Here, you can just use an array of strings as shown that corresponds to the order of the one hot encodings used. So if the model had the highest number output position at position 0 on the outputs layer, then you can just look up the element 0 in this array to find the human readable name of t-shirt in this case. Finally, I added some code to set an interval between classifications once the model has trained. In the HTML shown at the top here, a div is added containing a paragraph and an input range slider that you can use to change how fast you want to classify random images from the dataset. All this code does is add an event listener for the change in value to the input, and when a change is detected, it updates a variable called interval that will be used by the set timeout in your classification loop. By default, the interval is two seconds, but you can drag the slider to go much faster. Okay. So now you're up to date with the small changes to the demo code, it's time to actually edit this demo code to create a CNN instead of using the multi-layer perceptron that it currently uses. In this section, you'll modify parts of index.html, so go ahead and open that. First, update the header and paragraph tag text, and then replace the second section tag with the content shown, so the wording is up to date and relevant for this demo. These are just textual updates and do not affect any of the functionality of the demo. Great, from here you'll be editing the existing code found in script.js. The first thing to do is to comment out the call to the train function right after the model definition code. But why? Well, training a CNN in the browser is quite a resource intensive task. Even though the final model may run very fast in the browser, the math required for the changing of the weights and the filter values is very high for the training phase. In fact, Typically, you would do the training for more advanced models like this on the server side via Node.js, but for the purpose of learning, you should try it in the browser first. In this case, you don't want to start the training process until everything is defined correctly, as Glitch will refresh and try to run your code automatically if you've got the preview window open. Okay, next remove the current model definitions to make room for your CNN code. First, you call model.add with a tf.layers.conv2d layer. This is the layer that will do the convolution step that you just learned about. Let's walk through some of the hyperparameters that have been set. As this is the first layer in the model, you must define the input shape just like you've done so before. However, for a 2D convolutional layer like this, it expects the shape to be in the form of width, height, and number of color channels. Here, your input image is 28 by 28 pixels and is grayscale, so has only one color channel. If you're using an RGB image, this value would be set to three. Now you can set how many convolutional filters you want to generate with this layer. Just like the diagram at the end of the last section, you'll choose 16 filters for this part. Now you need to define the size of each of those 16 filters. 
Remember that ML folk like to call filters kernels. So here you specify a property called kernel size, which for this demo is set to three, meaning you'll generate 16 three by three square filters to pass over the input image. If you wanted to use a rectangular filter, you could do so by specifying an array containing the dimensions for the width and height as needed. Next, strides is set to one, meaning you're gonna move and calculate a filter value for every pixel in the input image. And related to that, you can set a padding method to deal with the pixels around the edges of the image. Here, you use a property called same that will ensure the missing values are filled with zeros so the filter can still work on those edge pixels. Alternatively, you can specify a number to use directly instead. Finally, just like you had in your multi-layer perceptron, you can also specify an activation function. Here, you use the popular ReLU activation to ensure nonlinear relations can be learned from the training data. Great, you can now add a tf.layers.maxpooling 2D layer. Here, you'll set its pool size to two and a stride of two, just like you learned in the prior section. This means your 28 by 28 pixel input will be transformed into an output that's 14 by 14 pixels in size after this max pooling layer. All you need to do now is replicate this code one more time as shown. Let's dive into the differences. In this conv2d layer, you have double the number of filters, in this case 32 instead of 16, but the other properties are actually exactly the same. You then have a second max pooling layer after this second convolutional layer. Also, as a side note, you may see in some CNN architectures that they have multiple convolutional layers before adding a max pooling layer. So do note that you can chain these layers together in a very flexible manner, but can use a lot more processing power to train the model if you end up doing that. Finally, you can add code to run the outputs for a regular multi-layer perceptron. Let's walk through it. First, you must flatten the outputs from the max pooling layer in the previous step. Remember, at this stage, the max pool has 32 7 by 7 outputs. And as you're aware, a multi-layer perceptron needs a big long list of numbers to sample with its starting layer. You can therefore use tf.layers.flatten to do exactly that and convert those outputs into a big long list of numbers that can be fed into your classification network. Next, you can add a dense layer with 128 neurons with ReLU activation, as you've seen before. And then finally, another dense layer with 10 neurons. As this is the output layer, this means you need to use the softmax activation in the case of classification tasks like this. Now, if you take a look at the console at this point, after a short pause, you'll see the model summary printed similar to this. Notice how the total trainable parameters is over 200,000. If you check your original multi-layer perceptron example for image classification that you just copied at the start of this tutorial, it had about 25,000 parameters. So this is almost 10 times the size and it'll take quite some time to train, but thankfully, when you actually use the train model, it'll still be really fast. Next, let's head to the train function and adjust a few parameters. First and most importantly, we need to reshape the current training data inputs to be in a form that the CNN input layer can digest. Remember that the training data is just an array of arrays containing a list of 784 numbers, but your CNN wants inputs to be a batch of 28 by 28 by one in size. To do this, you can call dot reshape on a tensor and then pass an array of numbers specifying the new shape you want to resize it to. The first value is the batch size, so inputs.length is used here. The second and third values represent the height and width. And then finally, the fourth value is the channel count. Next, you can set the validation split to be 0.15 to set aside 15% of the training data to see how well the model does on unseen data. And after experimenting with different values, 30 epochs turned out to be a good trade-off between time spent training and obtaining decent accuracy. However, feel free to experiment with this value yourself. Next, you can set the batch size to be 256. Again, this seemed to work well for me, but feel free to experiment with it. Okay, so finally, let's head over and update the evaluate function. First, you'll need to normalize the input you're about to use. Here, you can call the normalize function from the existing code with a tensor1d containing the input image and pass it the known min max values of zero and 255 respectively. As you're dealing with image data, you know all the values in the training data will be set in this range of zero to 255. Next, you can call model.predict with this normalized input, but remember to reshape it to be the form that the CNN needs, else you'll get an error. 
And just like before, you can call reshape on this tensor with a batch size of one and then specify a 28 by 28 pixel image with one color channel. The rest of the code in this function has not changed from what we've worked with before, so it should look familiar. Okay, so the only thing left to do now is to uncomment the call to the train function after the model definition code. Then open your console window in the browser and wait for it to finish training. Now this is gonna take a really long time, much longer than you're used to. On my reasonably modern laptop, it takes around five minutes to check that the epochs are incrementing in the console output to ensure there's no errors and nothing has crashed. The screen recording shown here is recorded in real time on my machine to give you a sense of how long each epoch takes, which for me is around 10 seconds, so do be patient. Also worth noting is that when you're training in the web browser, you must keep your web browser window open and visible, otherwise it will not get the full system resources and will take an extremely long time to do anything. This is just how browsers work and is nothing to do with TensorFlow.js. Basically, any background tab or window gets less resources, so make sure you keep it visible at all times while training. Okay, it's time to wait for your model to finish training, so hit the pause button on this video and come back once it's complete. So if all went well, after about five minutes, you should see it reach the final epoch with accuracy similar to the one shown here. For me, I got a test accuracy of 92% and a validation accuracy of 87%. Not too bad, even though it's managed to overfit the training data as shown by the higher test accuracy. But given this image data is a lot more complicated than the hand-drawn digits, this is still a great start. Now on the subject of overfitting, there are special layers called dropout layers that you can also look into on the TensorFlow.js API that you can add to your model architecture, which can help reduce overfitting. Essentially, these layers deactivate some fraction of the outputs of the prior layer randomly at training time by setting those selected values to zero. It should be noted, this only happens during training. When using the trained model, these layers will just not do anything. Now, this added noise, if you will, at training time can help as only the features that really matter all of the time will keep showing up in the training data. That means the network will learn those key patterns instead of the ones that only show up occasionally. Common values for dropout are 0.5 or 0.25, representing 50% and 25% dropout respectively. So finally here, you can see a screen capture of the completed result as I change the speed, trying random images from the data set using the slider. This is certainly much better than something that most folk could have coded without using a machine learning model and runs super fast once training completes. Not to mention, you can reuse it for other image data classes too without writing any more code. Just change the training data that you feed into it. So congratulations on creating your first CNN with TensorFlow.js. If you're having issues getting any of the code to work, check out my completed example at the link shown here to see if you copied anything incorrectly. Now there's certainly room for improvement State-of-the-art models can get well over 95% accuracy with some at 99.5%, which is truly incredible. But to do that, you'd probably want to train the model with more parameters within Node.js on the server with a decent graphics card to leverage the special CUDA acceleration that's available on the server side to make training go much faster. Now, thankfully, the code for Node is essentially the same as what you just learned. The only difference is being small things, like instead of using JS module imports for the training data, as you've been doing so far, you probably would load it from the local file system on the server, which would be faster, especially for larger training data sets. And on the subject of server-side execution in Node.js for training, it should be noted that there are two builds of TensorFlow.js Node that you can install on your Linux server. The default one uses the CPU known as tfjs-node. And there's also one that can leverage the GPU with CUDA acceleration known as tfjs-node-gpu. However, to use the latter, you'll need to install the correct drivers for your graphics card along with NVIDIA's CUDA library. It should be noted that in order to use that, you must be using an NVIDIA graphics card on that server. This is a somewhat involved process, but there are plenty of tutorials online that can show you how to do this. In fact, check the official TensorFlow.js node documentation on the link provided for more information if you want to try that out. Now in the next chapter, you'll learn all about transfer learning, which can greatly improve the time needed to retrain a model. You saw in this lesson how slow things can get for training, but if you trained a model for something similar, you can just add some layers at the very end and only train those instead of the whole model itself, saving a lot of time while still getting great results. 
In fact, this is what Teachable Machine does that you saw at the beginning of the course, which also uses CNNs to classify custom images, but as you saw, trains a lot faster. See you in the next session.